Uh, it's great to welcome you all to this. It's uh, one of the social and behavioral research branches seminar series. And here we highlight scholars who are conducting really innovative research at the intersection of genetics, the social and behavioral sciences, and health. And it's a really great pleasure to introduce you today to our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Jeremy Fries. Dr. Fries received his doctorate in sociology from Indiana University in 2000 with a special concentration on survey and experimental methodology. Following this work, he went on to be faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, then a Robert Wood Johnson Scholar in Health Policy Fellow at Harvard University, and then the Ethel and John Lindgren Professor of Sociology at Northwestern. And currently, he's a professor of sociology at Stanford University. Here, his research focuses on the relationship between social differences and individual differences, including work that connects biology, psychology, and social processes. And Dr. Fries is also the co-leader of the Health Disparities Working Group for the Stanford Center of Population Health Sciences. He's also a principal investigator on a wide variety of shared uh, data resources, of which I'm sure some will be mentioned today. But today, he's going to also share with us his perspective on using polygenic risk scores to better integrate genetics and the social sciences. Join me in welcoming Dr. Fries. Thank you very much. Do I have to use this mic as well as the wireless mic? No. In fact, that would be bad. OK, great, great. All right, uh, thank you very much. I am excited to be here today. I have. Um, I apologize if I, so this is part, I thought coming from the West Coast, I, I was able to stack up several different uh, stops and events and things, which uh, is great on one hand, but I've had a little bit of travel misadventure. So if I look a little rumpled uh, uh, as I visit you, that is what is, is going on. Um, so, uh, but let me, I'm, I'm gonna talk about a variety of different projects uh, uh, today, uh, which involve a, a host of different collaborators, uh, which I'll show here, and also of course, uh, involves uh, uh, funding from different uh, sources, uh, including uh, the National Institute on Aging for the Wisconsin data uh, that I'll talk about today, uh, NICHD for uh, Ad Health work, uh, and some other uh, research, as well as the National Science Foundation. Okay, um, I will give this talk in a, in a kind of a catechismic format. What I mean by catechismic is I'm gonna put up some questions, and then I will talk about those questions so that we can uh, follow along more easily uh, with things. Uh, but just to make sure that we're on the same page, what do I mean when I talk about a complex social outcome? Right? Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, what I mean when I say complex, people talk about complex trait uh, genetics. What I want to emphasize with a complex social outcome is just that, and, and we won't go into those diagrams, but those are related to a couple of papers that I've, I've talked about on, on uh, how to think about integrating genetic and social causes, but just that, uh, especially we're going to talk about educational attainment, for example. In, in my field, as, as was mentioned, I, I uh, am in a sociology department. Educational attainment is uh, the single most studied non-demographic variable in uh, sociology because there's a lot of sociology that deals both with uh, education, like what, what uh, causes educational attainment or correlates of educational attainment, and then what implications it has uh, over uh, the life course. And educational attainment, but when you talk to people, especially interdisciplinary audiences about educational attainment, people will often imagine, for example, they'll talk very much like educational attainment is, is like an individual choice, which it kind of is, right? Or that with educational attainment, it's sort of like a trait in the way that, that uh, psychological or health outcome is a trait. And it kind of has features uh, of that as well. Um, and then it also has this logic of external response. That is to say that, that there are people who would uh, like to do better in school than what they do. There are people who would like to get into better colleges than they get into, or for that matter, to get into uh, or to continue their education than what they're able to. Right? So it's not simply a, ch a choice or a trade or an outcome. Um, and we have to keep that in mind when we study it. And yet, nevertheless, nevertheless, right, uh, uh, we can talk about, and this is the difficult thing, talking about how we might think about and use uh, genetic differences when we talk about uh, a complex social outcome. right? Um, and so why might we think that something like educational attainment is, is uh, uh, associated with genetic differences? Uh, the first sort of line of evidence from this comes to uh, twin studies. Right? And so from twin studies, uh, at one point, uh, Amelia Brannigan uh, and I, we collected all of the twin correlations that exist regarding educational attainment. And the backbone of a twin study is the idea that 
that monozygotic or identical twins are going to be more correlated than dizygotic or, or fraternal twins. So we collected all of those. And from that fact of from monozygotic and dizygotic twin correlations, you can back out what's called a heritability estimate. right? And so if you look across all of these different countries and, and samples, uh, while some samples are different, where you can back out from this um, uh, an average heritability estimate of 0.4, right? That is to say, a, an interpretation of that would be that that 40% of the variance in uh, educational attainment uh, is resolved by or explained by uh, genetic differences, given the assumptions of behavioral genetic models, right? But now, with that, behavior genetics has talked about. It's even characterized certain recurrent patterns in behavior genetics as, as being laws. There are laws of behavior genetics. And one of them, so you'll see here uh, uh, from a widely cited article, the second law of behavior genetics is that the effect of being raised in the same family is smaller than the effect of genes. Now that comes from, if you do a twin model, you can decompose what's called a shared and a non-shared environment. And this is, this is equating that estimate of a shared environment with a family effect. Now, I could do a whole thing on why that is, that is not a great interpretation. But this is just taking it uh, for what it is. This idea of that, that, that non-share or that shared environment uh, 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 component is, is very, usually very small. Uh, connected heritability, so much that they would call it a law. So small, in fact, that often when you're doing a model, it simply drops out, and you estimate it as being uh, zero for all kinds of traits. But what we found with educational attainment, and I think I mentioned that educational attainment, in my neck of the woods, the most studied variable is actually an exception to this law of behavior genetics. That's to say these blue squares are the estimate of the shared environment from a behavior genetics model for educational attainment. And you'll see that the shared environment uh, estimate is roughly the same as the heritability estimate. This is, in fact, the only trait educational attainment for which it has been documented this robustly that this is a case that you have a trait for which you have simultaneously a heritability estimate in the 0.4-ish sort of range and a shared environment in the 0.4 range as well. Uh, that is to say that educational attainment in some ways is different, and this reflects a way to think about what this is going to mean is that uh, siblings are more similar to each other in educational attainment than uh, they would be in something like personality traits or something like that, right? Uh, 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 from models, there's an unusual concordance in educational attainment, which is, depending on your background, maybe not that surprising, but we can even see it in these models that it behaves unusually, right? Now, but of course, right? We're just talking about educational attainment. Of course, we can see that uh, genes and environments are going to interact. And we've known that and talked about that for a very, very long uh, time. A famous model of this, though, right, in terms of how, how are we going to get at or think about how genes and environments interact is this idea that uh, uh, cognitive ability, for example, varies by socioeconomic status. The idea there would be this is, this is in fact, a quite old idea, but it got over kind of such old by means it's, it uh, dates to the early 1970s, is sort of the first uh, article trying to show this. Uh, but it got a lot of attention back starting in 2003, right? Um, uh, with this dramatic finding, the idea would be that environments, uh, sometimes people will use a phrase like draw out potential. The idea would be that advantaged environments uh, are, are uh, stronger at drawing out potential of the child. And so, and so genetic differences, heritability is actually a sign of then of, of, of progress or good or in an enriched environment. Um, and in low SES environments, uh, one does not see uh, that same level of heritability. It's been a very evocative uh, idea for that. Um, but then it's sort of uh, a couple of things have sort of happened in this literature more recently when people have tried to sort of, of look at this work. Um, one thing is that this, this giant effect like this, people have not been finding that uh, in other uh, samples. But then also there's raised this idea of a kind of American uh, exceptionalism. That is to say that affects, in this case, uh, uh, the dark blue or black. Uh, dots are showing a larger effect than the red dots. That is to say that people have actually not found uh, evidence of this so much in uh, other countries, Australia, uh, the UK, Scandinavian countries, than they have in the United States. And there's been different theories for why that might be the case. The, the US welfare state, uh, greater socioeconomic diversity in the United States relative to some place like Scandinavia. So we decided with some collaborators, this is a, a couple of economists at, at Northwestern University, uh, to look at this with respect to Florida. We're going to be making a few different 
stops at different destinations. Uh, today, our first is uh, the state of uh, Florida, um, because uh, what we were looking at with this is using administrative records from the state of Florida. So these economists uh, and uh, some others have put together administrative records uh, matching uh, birth records and school records for every child uh, born in the state of Florida who went to public schools over like a six or seven year period. So an enormous uh, sample and also relative to twin studies, not as selected as a, of a sample as normally. So twin studies are often have issues, with especially recruitment of low uh, socioeconomic status uh, individuals into those studies. But when you have administrative records, you have effectively everybody that is in the, in the birth records and school uh, system. And so uh, now we don't have for this, there's not anywhere on your birth certificate if you're a twin. It doesn't say anywhere if you're an identical twin or a fraternal twin. Uh, but what we do have, so we can tell a twin from birth records because they're going to have the same birth date, the same mother listed on the birth certificate, right? Um, and we can tell that they're same sex or opposite sex pairs, right? And every opposite sex pair is a dizygotic twin, right? Every opposite zygotic. Whereas same sex pairs, the way that it works out is, is uh, about half the people who are in same sex pairs are uh, identical twins, about half are fraternal twins, uh, roughly. Um, I didn't say that quite right, but let's just move on. Um, but what, what we can do then is we can look, this is going to be uh, intercorrelational coefficients, but just so that we get the idea of the hypothesis, remember the idea is, is that you see a fanning out with bigger, better environments. And so what we'd expect to see here is we would expect to see these things diverging as we move up the levels of mother's education uh, here. Um, but in fact, that's not uh, what we observe. And this is the largest, this makes having administrative data means we're the largest study uh, that has ever done this. Uh, but both for math and reading tests and for uh, younger and older uh, children, uh, we don't see any evidence of this ourselves. So uh, Florida is certainly uh, uh, socioeconomically uh, diverse. It's slightly more socioeconomically diverse than the United States uh, at large. Um, and so uh, a lot of uh, explanations. And so really, we're not sure about that version, that simple version of this theory at all from this. And we'll be interested to see how replication in the future works. Even having said that, though, this underlying idea, I've called it uh, at least one place, the pervasive environmental reinforcement hypothesis, is a powerful idea. And it, it, I think it's probably a true idea. And I think the issue is, is, that, is that these sort of twin designs just provide a very blunt idea that all of heritability is going to work in one way or another way or something like that. It's like likely. But the, the core idea here, right, or, or one idea of, of a gene environment correlation that could be pervasive over the life course. And we can, in fact, think about this as uh, maybe even easier if you think about other talents uh, than thinking about uh, uh, cognitive abilities. But we can see where early displays of ability can lead both to uh, people's choices into environments and environmental responses that lead to later displays of ability. Right? So a well-documented example would be the children uh, who show early aptitude at reading. Uh, they read more. Right? Uh, they get more out of reading. They form more of an identity uh, of a reader. Uh, and so as a result, they're getting more practice uh, at reading. Uh, and so uh, it wouldn't be surprising from that alone that you could imagine a gap in reading emerging after later uh, displays. And we can think about this in all kinds of other domains, this idea of environments uh, reinforcing one another. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today, so we're talking here about twin designs. But of course, there's long been this movement to having molecular genetic data and interest in, in this. And we're going to move uh, to the polygenic score. But we should make clear, like, why? Why are we talking about polygenic scores? Like, why don't we just look at individual genetic variants? And it depends on where the audience is for how well they are familiar with what the answer to that is going to be. Um, but, but there was uh, a, a period where people did uh, exactly this, right? And, and there were many headlines as a, as a result of that, finding uh, a link between a single genetic variant and uh, violence and and uh, delinquency, right? Uh, for that matter, ideas about biology strongly governing uh, voter turnout uh, based on uh, a single genetic uh, variant. Um, a lot of this work uh, was using the Ad Health uh, data set, which is a great data set. This is not, and they were pioneering in having genetic uh, data available, but they started by having six genetic variants available. And then all kinds of associations were shown with those six. Uh, genetic variants in the ad health uh, data. Uh, close to home, for example, the American Journal of Sociology has a paper uh, published uh, uh, 2000, 
2008, 2009 or so, right? With a single genetic variant, they're calling this DRD2 risk. The, the genetic variant in question is, is the TAC1A, familiar TAC1A variant, which is not actually in, uh, but is near uh, the DRD2 uh, gene. So this is dopamine receptor uh, uh, genetic variant. Uh, but what you can see here, right, is you can see that um, the table is presenting uh, effectively a 15 percentage point difference, depending on if you have this single uh, uh, allele, right? Whether or not you have this single allele. 15 percentage point difference, a difference so large that if you imagine all of the reasons, uh, all the social reasons that lead to, to white-black differences in educational attainment, the idea would be that the single genetic variant would be larger than all of those if you look across the table. That's just, when you kind of think about it, it doesn't really necessarily uh, pass muster as plausible. And so it's, perhaps it's not necessarily that surprising. This is, this is from the data set that's used. The idea would be that, that uh, the percentage, if you're homozygous, uh, you're homozygous on C, that you have a 50-some percent chance of going to college, whereas you're homozygous on T, you only have a 30-some percent chance of going to college. I put this. Uh, as you might notice in Carolina blue, because it's the ad health sample. Um, but we tried it early thing to replicate this using uh, the Wisconsin data that, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Wisconsin will be in red uh, as a demonstration. And we can see that we didn't find any evidence of this in, in our effort uh, to replicate this. And, um, and of course, that's, that's the story that happened with so much of this. We talk about it now. I don't know how broadly, but in the social science genomics world, we talk about this as the candidate gene era. We talk about it in kind of the sort of hushed tones of a Halloween ghost story as if we had a flashlight uh, on our uh, 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 faces as we talk about it, uh, as uh, so much uh, failed uh, to replicate uh, subsequently. And in fact, we can even see recently, right, with the UK Biobank, people have produced uh, uh, results from the UK Biobank, which is going to be based on 500,000 uh, individuals uh, and looking across uh, a genome-wide set of assaying. This is the TAC1A variant in question. And uh, this is basically just somewhere in the middle of a long list of non-significant hits at this point. So even with 500,000, there's not any evidence that this variant um, uh, that uh, in the ad health sample looked like it had a 15 percentage point effect has any effect whatsoever on educational attainment once we get to a really large sample. right? I should mention um, that I, I think that the scalding effects of the candidate gene era uh, on this uh, research also probably show themselves in uh, other guises with respect to uh, wariness of like how are things going to turn out with various kinds of epigenetic measures, uh, various kind of biomarker measures. There are people who, who have jumped in with both feet on this. There are other people. Um, myself included, who are very reticent just because um, we've, been, we've been hurt before, as they would say, um, by these different measures, and we're not sure what is going to be hype and what is going to be true, which makes the fact that I'm going to talk about polygenic scores here in an enthusiastic way more meaningful in this respect, because uh, I do feel like we have reason to think that this works, and I'll explain why. Okay. So let's think about, can a polygenic score be developed for educational attainment? Right. And if you're familiar with the history of, of GWAS at all, there was, there was a period in time uh, in GWAS where there was a question whether this was really going to work at all, right? So the early GWAS studies uh, were not finding much of anything. And when, when uh, the group of people that are the SSGAC, the group of economists forming the big first study of this, started and started to try to assemble cases on educational attainment, there were people, in fact, who I think thought that they were, were insane, um, uh, or certainly that they were not going to find uh, anything, that this was a really big long shot, even people who were, who were giving their data to uh, the study, because obviously we all know that educational attainment is very complex, including the people who are doing this, this, these, these studies. And yet, nevertheless, and a reason that educational attainment was so promising is that medical studies routinely asked educational attainment in the studies. They don't, they're not going to be doing anything with it in the GWAS framework otherwise. But it's collected, it's available in a very large number of studies, routinely collected. And if you're going to have something, people can report educational attainment very accurately. They can report it very quickly compared to those of us who try to do psychological measures alongside them. 
So there's a lot going for educational attainment as something that you can imagine assembling a large sample with, right? Their first uh, effort, when they, when they got over six figures to 100,000, they found three hits with educational attainment, right? Um, what I'm showing here is from their uh, Nature article uh, from 2014, right? Um, and at that point, they had uh, uh, nearly 300,000 individuals and they had 71 hits, including their three initial hits all replicated, right? So what I mean by a hit is uh, uh, GWAS, because you're doing, in a genome-wide study, you've got a million uh, or more different genetic variants. As a result of that, you use a high stringent standard of correction, uh, uh, a p to the 10 to the negative eighth power. Um, and so something is considered a significant hit. They also do some cross-validation with replication samples, but we won't get into that. Um, uh, but what they found are 71 different along the genome, 71 different hits. And you'll see from this, right, that they're spread all across the genome. They're not concentrated in any one uh, location or anything of that nature. Now, what I, what I can't show you, but what this group has presented, um, uh, so I feel comfortable talking about, even for YouTube, uh, talking about is that they have amassed, uh, at this point, with uh, UK Biobank and with an agreement with 23andMe, they're over a million. Uh, with their sample, and now that they have uh, over a million, and just imagine all of this just shifting up over the bar, so now they have uh, over uh, 1,000 uh, hits um, uh, across the genome, and in terms of out-of-sample uh, predictive power, including in the Wisconsin data uh, that I'm going to be talking about later, uh, the predictive power of this score is uh, about the same, a little bit less, but about the same as uh, being able to predict a child's educational attainment, knowing the educational attainment of one of their parents, right? So if you know either the mother or the father, not both, but if you know either the mother or the father, that's about the same predictive value as what the polygenic score has now that it's over a million individuals, which in my neck of the woods is a pretty good amount of predictive information. It's not any kind of crazy determinism that some people think you're going to get into when you talk about genetics, but it's a meaningful signal uh, regarding educational attainment. Right? Now, in terms of, of how we're going to use the, this score, uh, one of the things that we're going to see, and that's a big issue um, in this field, is uh, thinking about uh, these polygenic scores and these GWAS studies almost entirely are concentrated among European populations. There is now more um, uh, 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 GWAS studies of East Asian populations, particularly Han Chinese uh, populations. Uh, than there was before, but still, it's, it's a very white uh, uh, field. And so the question then is, can you apply polygenic scores developed uh, from a European ancestry population to other populations? Can you just go into a data set like Ad Health or HRS and generate a, a polygenic prediction for everybody? Um, and there's great reasons to be very cautious about doing this, uh, particularly a uh, striking example, uh, at least for me, is this paper that was published in uh, uh, Human Genetics and uh, 2017, uh, and what they show, they're using some simulation of, of data from a GWAS study of height, um, and what they show here is that if you had calculated polygenic scores for this whole population, or for this, these different populations, using a European polygenic scores for height, the scores people would use for height, you would think, for example, <coughs> so it is the case that if you, if you look at an African-descended population, it is the case that the score will be correlated for height within that population, right? Um, but if you look, uh, actually the African population is in, is in red here, if you, if you just looked at the polygenic score, you would, you would think that there was almost no, there's almost no overlap in the polygenic score between the European-descended population and the African-descended population, right? Even though uh, anthropological evidence makes abundantly clear that there's not an actual height difference between these two populations, right? So in other words, the scores may predict within populations. They're going to predict weaker within non-European populations. But the idea that somehow then you're going to be able to go uh, and look at, at differences, um, that is uh, a source of extreme nervousness, right? And, and, um, and it's especially nervous when we start talking about things that are much more morally freighted than height is. But the height provides a good example of the underlying problem, right? Um, uh, for this reason, uh, at this point, uh, this research relies uh, e even samples that are uh, uh, nationally representative will almost certainly do their analyses 
uh, only on the European descended, the white respondents, right? In other words. Um, okay, so, so nevertheless, can we be confident that these scores uh, actually work? That is to say that these scores are capturing causal variation, right? And like I said, I mean, this has to be understood in the context of, of other things that have been tried. Other things have been told to, to social scientists from the medical and experts at the time, this is going to work. And then when applied to our samples, this didn't really work. So polygenic scores, why might we think that, that this uh, works? Why is there so much enthusiasm for this? Right? Uh, for this, we're going to have a little foray into the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I want to describe the Wisconsin uh, data that I will be, uh, be using. Um, I'll do that uh, by way of talking about, I don't know, this is an increasingly dated uh, reference to audiences, right? But this really was, honest to God, at one point a thing, right? Uh, this TV show, uh, Happy Days, was number one show in uh, the United States for three years in the 1970s, right? for like seven or eight uh, seasons. Happy Days uh, takes place in uh, Milwaukee, right? Uh, Milwaukee is in Wisconsin, just as first steps, right? But so, so uh, and, and follow the, the adventures of, of Richie and Patsy and Ralph and early example of sitcom breakout star, the Fonz uh, up there in the corner. But as you see, they, they, it takes place in the fictional Jefferson High in uh, Wisconsin. And even uh, takes place uh, in uh, Richie, Patsy, and Ralph were graduating seniors in 1957 in the state of Wisconsin, which is exactly the sample that I am talking about by uh, amazing uh, coincidence. That is, the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study is a sample. So in 1957, uh, uh, nearly all schools in Wisconsin, uh, the seniors were given a survey. right? Uh, and that survey, one third of those respondents became the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. Right. Originally, they were just surveyed for purposes of studying college aptitude sorts of things. Then it became sort of the leading study of social mobility uh, in, uh, for status attainment models, if you've ever heard of that, in sociology. And in a sense, it's become a study of aging uh, and health. But it's a one-third sample. Right? And so that means, if you think about, about Richie and Potsy and Ralph, those three students, you can imagine one of those three would be. So Richie, for example, might be in the WLS. Right? The Fonz, incidentally, would not be in the WLS because uh, the Fonz uh, did not graduate from high school. Right? Um, he was a couple years older. He did get his GED, incidentally, at the end of season three. But that would not be good enough to get him in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. Right? So that is, that is our data. Um, what we have then as a result, the core sample of the WLS is, about, is based on about 10,000 people. Um, the rates of survey attrition from the WLS over the years have been actually very good compared to longitudinal studies. But of course, you do have uh, survey attrition. And for that matter, people start to die um, and such. Uh, what that means is for the DNA sample, we first collected saliva used for DNA in 2006 or so. Um, and then we, we tried again in 2011, 2012 uh, to, to collect uh, saliva from people who hadn't or whose samples were very good. But we have about uh, the saliva from about 9,000 people, including 2,048 pairs, right? So the WLS is a, is a graduate in the high school graduating class in 1957 and a randomly selected uh, sibling. So if you remember Happy Days, Richie had sibling Joni. Joni could have been selected into the sample as well. They could both be in our sample and they could be a sibling pair. Okay. So that's our data. Let's actually take up a side question. Uh, we're getting back to the effectiveness of polygenic scores, but can we actually see ancestral structure just in the uh, white WLS respondent? A graph that I have, have seen probably a dozen or more times in different talks on this area that people will show is this. Have people, anybody seen this before? Right? Is this some people know? Well, we'll see. Uh, so this graph uh, was an early example from 2008 of someone uh, taking, uh, actually it was not at that time genome-wide data, but it was data from a lot of, of, of different genomic markers, doing a principal components analysis and then laying the first two dimensions of that principal components over a map, right? And what that showed is that you could see, uh, uh, you, you could locate sort of, uh, this is where the respondents actually were by their place in the components. You could sort of reproduce, if you spun it around, you could reproduce a map of Europe based on 
uh, genetic markers. Right? Now, if we think about that with uh, the state of Wisconsin, we imagine, well, we could take our genome-wide data and we could do a couple of factor analysis and we could put it over the state of Wisconsin. Right? That, that's probably not a very good idea, right? Because people in the state of, of, of Wisconsin, white Wisconsin respondents, uh, are all migrants from somewhere on this map, from different regions on this map. All right, so that itself wouldn't make that much sense. But, but we have asked in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, we've asked people what country in Europe their ancestors are from. Right? And so what we can do is we can take respondents who say both of their parents were from a particular country in Europe, and then we can look at this. Now, they didn't locate exactly what city or whatever, but we do have the country of origin. When we do that, what we'll do is uh, we can see, so red is, is uh, the parents are both British. Uh, blue over there is the parents are both Polish. What you see is you can actually reproduce in the WLS. You can see a, uh, an east to west or west to east axis um, uh, consistent with where these countries are located in Europe based on the, the first two principal components in the WLS data. Now, we can also start to ask questions about <coughs> whether we can get other information uh, relevant to evaluating self-reports and surveys from uh, genomic information. For example, right, uh, in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, there is in the state of Wisconsin, there is a Native American reservation that's coterminous with a county in Wisconsin. That high school was not included uh, in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. But there are other uh, survey respondents in the WLS who report uh, Native American ancestry. All right, now, the thing about reporting Native American on a survey that some of you may be familiar with is there's, there's a couple of reasons why uh, those reports can, can uh, be especially problematic. One is that there are some people who uh, believe they, they have Native American ancestry but do not. There's some kind of familial lore uh, about the question, perhaps, that is not uh, the case. And then it's also the case that there's a subset of survey respondents who who really want to assert that they are American um, uh, versus some other uh, descent. And so they will, they will report that uh, as well. Right? But, but uh, we can think to ourselves, well, we have a sibling report. And so what if there are some people for whom, so if they're full siblings, and of course having genetic data, we, we know if they're full siblings regardless of what they might tell us. But, but full siblings could either, full siblings certainly have the same ancestors, right? So they have the same ancestry, and they could either disagree on this question or they could agree, right? And so we can look uh, at that. And so this is, this is, I should say, distance from the center uh, in terms, don't look at the, the vertical axis, this is just jitter. Um, but in other words, uh, this is the center of those principal components moving out uh, to uh, the most genetically distinct people out there uh, in the sample. And if we, we do that, uh, we can see from this that the orange dots are cases where the siblings disagree and the blue dots are cases where the siblings agree. We can see that in the WLS uh, sample that, in fact, when the siblings disagree, uh, they're much more likely to be indistinguishable from uh, respondents who don't report any Native American ancestry than the respondents uh, who do. Um, uh, uh, yes. Okay. Now, let's get back to this question of whether we can uh, feel confident the polygenic score is capturing causal uh, variation. Right? And a way that I have shown, well, one, we can just look at the sibling correlation, uh, which hopefully is going to, okay. There's a great scatter plot here, and it's gone. Um, but I think uh, we will otherwise be okay. The correlation is about 0.53 between the two siblings in their, their polygenic score. But this is what I want to show. So we can, we can, instead of just looking at the relationship between the polygenic score and educational attainment, we can estimate, it's a simple sort of thing, but it's intuitively very clear, uh, uh, between within model, right? That is to say that we'll take the polygenic score, right, and we'll make it actually two variables, right? One variable will be the average polygenic score of siblings, and the other will be the deviation from that average, right? And so if it were the case Right? So first of all, it was the case that the polygenic score was just noise relative to the WLS, and there won't be any between or within effect. Right? But if it were the case uh, that the polygenic score was just picking up uh, either ancestral confounding or some kind of confounding that was not actually causal, we would expect that it, there are differences going to be between the pairs, right? but there won't actually be differences within the pair. 
right, once you look within pairs. So, it'll be, so in other words, we'll have an effect here, but we won't have any effect there, right? And so when we do this in WLS, right, um, uh, this is the magnitude of the effect that on, uh, of the polygenic score on years of education uh, that we observe between pairs. And so the question is, is that going to be similar to that, or is that going to be closer to zero? Okay, well, that's a, right? Uh, in fact, this is what we observe, right? Uh, no attenuation uh, whatsoever, uh, in fact, uh, in the polygenic score in the between or within, right? Um, and that, that to me is, uh, for one, until I sort of had the data and could sort of run something, I was like, well, ready, maybe not to, but, but, but it's very hard to explain why you would have, and this has been replicated in other samples uh, even before we showed it in WLS, but uh, it's very hard to explain how you would have a, a within pair difference in the score. That is to say, what this means, just to be clear, is that, that the sibling with the higher polygenic score is more likely to be the sibling that has more educational attainment. Right? If we look at the siblings who are kind of in the upper half of the distribution of the magnitude, so if the sibling scores are pretty close, then that probability is going to be pretty close. If we look at the full siblings who are kind of in the upper half of having the bigger difference, it's about a 70-30 guess. That is to say, the sibling with a higher score will have the higher education if they differ 70% of the time. Right? Which is not a small difference, right? If you were, if you were using it to gamble on uh, kids' education, that would be a big uh, advantage. Right? Now, we could also see the same <coughs> between and within uh, with some other measures we could look at. In the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, um, uh, we have uh, a measure of their test scores when they were in high school, right? The Wisconsin State testing, they gave tests in freshman and junior in high school, and those are all matched to the respondents. And we can see, again, we have a very consistent between and within effect uh, for cognitive test scores. This is using the educational attainment score to predict uh, cognition. Um, we could also see, right, we can also see that if you look at the children of the WLS respondents, they, the respondents reported whether or not they, they reported a roster of their children and whether their children had a college degree. We can also see that the polygenic score predicts both between and within families, right? So the sibling with a higher polygenic score is more likely to have a higher proportion of their children that they report finishing college. Now, it could be that one one as well is a between and within uh, always the same and, and, and that sort of thing. There was um, a finding, uh, a, a couple of papers that have come out uh, that have reported that uh, the polygenic score for educational attainment is associated with the number of children that people have. And this has, in fact, been used to uh, make argument the effect is small. And so the argument would be that it corresponds to like a year of educational attainment over like a thousand years uh, or something like that. Um, but this idea that this is associated <coughs> with fertility. Um, in fact, in the Wisconsin data, um, you can see that there's, while it doesn't attenuate all to zero, you can see that when we use between within there, this is because higher scores associated with, anyway, with fewer children, uh, you can see that that's actually not the case. So we actually do not, the studies that have been published so far have not had within family uh, data to show this. And when we look at the within family data, we do not have, we do not see evidence um, of there being a relationship between the score and fertility itself. Okay, so then what can we do once we have that polygenic score? And I'm just going to roll out some applications that we've, we've been talking about with WLS. One is we can look at differences among schools, right? And so uh, a question when one looks at school effects is, okay, well, more kids from this school go to college then kids from this school go to college. But does that reflect selection going into the school? Does that reflect just differences between the students? Are there actual differences uh, between schools? Um, and we can look at this. And so the model that I'm going to show is going to have Ad Health and Wisconsin data. Um, it is going to, but the, the question is, is we're going to have a bunch of different regression slopes for the different schools, is what I'm going to show. And what we found, right, is it's even more kind of market in hand health. In Wisconsin, it gets a little bit, the pattern because of the fact that the, the focal respondents are at least high school graduates, there's some truncation that we have to kind of work with. And this is probably the more striking demonstration of the pattern. What we see is we certainly see big intercept differences. That is to say that people who have the same polygenic score for educational attainment can have vastly different uh, uh, probabilities of going to college, right, or their ultimate educational attainment. But what we don't see, and this, might exact, this is closer to this than one might think when one corrects for the attenuation. 
that there's not great evidence of differences across schools in the extent to which you could think about it, the returns to the polygenic score for educational attainment. Right? So in other words, there's, there's, there's clear differences of some overall mean level effect between schools. There's less, uh, and in fact, maybe a clear demonstration that there's not differences that schools are more efficient or effective or something like that, or however one metaphor one would want to use in the relationship between the score and educational attainment. Right? <clears throat> now, can we use the polygenic score to estimate genetic confounding in the relationship between parental SES and educational attainment? That is to say right, that, that there's a big literature uh, uh, showing uh, all kinds of uh, the, the clear relationship between uh, parents' socioeconomic status, parents' education, and, such, and children's educational attainment. Right? Um, uh, but that literature has always been dogged by the idea, well, maybe this is just genes causing educational attainment and, and, and not. And so with the polygenic score, can we sort of get at that confounding? Now, if you just put, so you might imagine, OK, well, let's, let's just, do, we could do a regression of child education on uh, parental education, and then we'll put in the polygenic score as a control variable, and we'll see how much the coefficient attenuates. Now, if you just do that, the score doesn't really, the coefficient doesn't really attenuate very much, right? Uh, but then you think, well, but that score is, is, is like I said, I mean, even, even now it only predicts 10%. Uh, the earlier version only predicted 4 or 5%. That's not really a very fair test. You have to think about what the random degree of measurement error is, right? And so uh, we've done a little bit with this, but it really, you have to involve an idea of what you think the structure of that measurement error is. Even if you just think it's random measurement error, you have to have an idea, well, how much, how much signal do we think in that is versus the total amount of noise uh, in that signal? Right, but just to kind of show you what it looks like, um, so zero attenuation would mean that uh, there's no reason to think that there's any genetic confounding whatsoever. The 100% would mean that, oh, it looks like the whole thing is genetic confounding. Right? You can say, what's it, what's it going to look like? Imagine, to predict. Uh, it turns out that uh, it varies a lot depending on what the underlying assumption of variance is. Right? E but even under the even under the strongest uh, assumptions as you imagine in terms of the weak signal, uh, it's no more than 70% than, uh, attenuation. And uh, under the weakest assumptions uh, or under the weakest ideas, maybe around 30%. I probably think that the real answer is going to prove to be somewhere in here. Uh, but we'll see. But the answer, in other words, is that yes, there is uh, some confounding of that association. But no, the relationship is not entirely confounding. Right? Uh, uh, but then between that, it's going to depend a lot on, on uh, assumptions about error. Okay. All right. Let me. S well, I'll mention it. Um, so uh, this paper uh, that got a lot of attention in psychological science, collaborator Dan Belsky, showed that the polygenic score was associated with, uh, they used the Dunedin cohort. So these are people based in New Zealand. Um, and uh, they showed, in fact, that the polygenic score was associated with leaving, the, leaving New Zealand. So people with a higher uh, polygenic score were more likely to leave uh, the state of, or to leave, not the state of, the country of, of New Zealand for elsewhere. Um, and so that raises the question of, well, we've got people from Wisconsin. Um, is it associated with leaving the state of, of Wisconsin? Um, and in fact, that it is. Um, we can show evidence that it is. It's not the case. I had thought, I grew up on a farm, so I feel like I can study this part of it, that, um, that uh, I had thought that the uh, relationship might be stronger for rural areas. Um, but that's actually not actually the case. We have not found evidence of that. Um, uh, if anything, there might be more uh, out of Milwaukee um, than out of rural areas. Um, but um, uh, there is a clear relationship uh, there. Um, and then what we've been trying to do, uh, so this is, this is sort of uh, tentative, but but I mean, the thing about educational attainment is that it's associated with so many different uh, post-education outcomes, right? Virtually everything. This is why uh, it's so widely studied. And when you when you think about data sets like something like Ad Health or something like but the Wisconsin data set or the Health and Retirement Study, large-scale survey projects, right? They tend to be assemblages of a lot of different interests, as a result of which they measure a lot of different things a large number of different life domains. They may not measure any of them all that super well, but they measure a lot of different sorts of domains, a lot of which then show themselves to be associated with educational attainment. 
and we just kind of take it for granted that uh, educational attainment is going to be associated with uh, things that we study. It's, it's more interesting when it's not. Um, uh, and if we just think about this in just a very simple, like first first month of uh, progression class sort of uh, framework, right? We might imagine. And this is what's so different about a propensity score. What I think that that for social scientists is it really takes some getting one's head around that I think that that the field collectively is going to have to figure out. Like certainly we're we're all used to dealing with antecedent variables, but the idea of something that is developed fully as a predictive measure of something that we have observed, right? That is very, very different. Um, uh, and you, what, the way that you'll see this manifested is people lapse into wanting to talk about that polygenic score as something. Like you'll see, like there's, there's uh, some economists who've done papers on like essentially equating that with ability, right? And just saying, using it as a proxy for ability, right? But there's ways that you could measure something like, and that's not the score, right? The score is everything that predicts. The closest analog I can think to my mind is imagining, like imagine if you had a data set where you had people's credit score, all right? So you have their credit score, but you don't know otherwise how, how that credit, just the credit score, it's like it just came from God, or in our case, came from the people who did our genotyping, or whatever. You get the score, right? Uh, and so then it would be a puzzle to figure out, well, what are the things that we have in our data set that are associated, and how does that score work? And in that process of figuring that out, you would learn a fair bit about credit default, right, and the causes of default and things. And that's possibly the promise of this, right? But just from a simple causal perspective, you have a propensity score, right? It could be the case that, that any uh, effect of that propensity score, the things that go into that propensity score, on things that happen after educational attainment are fully mediated by educational attainment. Right? That, that's why. It could even be that it's the fact that educational attainment is a cause. Right? And the second model we would all be familiar with would be the idea that, well, the propensity score contains things, and those things cause educational attainment, and those other things in later life cause. Right? And then we would know from regression costs, OK, well, that means that if you look at the association between the propensity score and the outcome, and then you put in uh, uh, educational attainment in the model, here, the correlation right, is going to go to 0, conditional on educational attainment. Right? And there, it's not going to be attenuated much at all right? on educational attainment. And we have those sorts of two lines of expectation. Right? We're just applying that here. And so if we look at things like occupational prestige or psychological well-being, if I would have put, had more room on the slide here, I might have put that migration measure in from, uh, from Wisconsin. And what we will see is we'll see this pattern of, of OK, well, um, when you look at uh, occupation, it's, it's basically all in the education variable, right? So, so there is a relationship between that polygenic score and occupational prestige, um, but it goes away when you put education in the model. Because if you look, and we looked across various domains, that educational attainment polygenic score is significantly associated with a whole lot of things, right? But that's really not that surprising, right? Because educational attainment is associated with all these things. This is what we would expect if we had enough sample, right? And we see the same thing with psychological well-being. But that's not what we see with every outcome. Right? So for example, if you look at being a non-smoker, um, there is some attenuation, but it's hardly uh, all uh, attenuated after that. So there are some outcomes for which there's not actually very much association. And our uh, conjecture, but we're at early stages of this, is trying to use sort of this attenuation across a large set of outcomes to try to figure out what this polygenic score is and how to uh, understand it. Right? And so, eh, this is going to be too tough to explain in the time we have left, because I'm supposed to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I'm just going to just go right past this, I think. Um, the basic thing that we are kind of observing, you'll just have to take my word for what this graph means, but that um, uh, it's especially like uh, health behaviors in, and, and uh, sort of that have very little attenuation. And then either sort of uh, uh, long run, uh, basically things that are really kind of associated with long run attainments in many cases are the things that have the very complete, um, uh, uh, almost full attenuation. Right? But we're going to skip this. And I just want to conclude by saying, what do I think are going to be the big directions uh, in this area? Uh, how are polygenic scores going to be used? I think there's going to be four big fronts at which they're used. What I mean here is to say that polygenic scores pose a puzzle, like I was saying, this credit score puzzle. And that process of figuring out 
what it is that those poly, what that polygenic score ultimately means, how we can decompose it. The polygenic score, to be clear, uh, is not, we have a very good measure of cognition in the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. That explains uh, on the short side of half of the association, anything like 40%. So it's not the case that the polygenic score is just a proxy for cognition. It is abundantly clear that that is not the case. Um, it does have promise as a statistical control if we can figure out how to adjust for it. It also, in this front, has great promise for people interested in RCTs of educational processes, for, for being able, perhaps, to increase the power of those studies, because a lot of those interventions are very expensive and every data point is valuable. Right? We can think about it as a moderator of different kinds of associations in an interactional framework. And then we can also think, and this is a benefit of sibling data, to think about natural experiments. So economists, although uh, uh, maybe doing a little bit less of this than they were five or 10 years ago, but they have this great hunt for exogenous variation. And so you'll see papers where some kind of weird policy change in Manitoba is, is latched upon and studied because it provides this great natural experiment of things. But right, I, I, an appealing aspect about genetics when you're used to seeing that is that all of us with full siblings are, in effect, natural experiments, right? because we have the random variation between ourselves and our siblings. So that offers the possibility of a great amount of power going forward for that design. Great. Fantastic. OK? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so uh, and that's an issue for this design, right? Because if there's, if there's, if there's sex differences, uh, you would see that. So we had two pieces of leverage on that, three actually. One is, is just for the scores, we just used, we used uh, uh, within sex standardized scores. So we eliminated any mean difference that way. We also put it all in the multi-level model where we had sex in the model. So we could, we could get uh, uh, that way. Um, uh, there, there is, especially in reading, there is a, there is a, a difference where girls do better on reading testing. So same-sex girl pairs are doing better than same-sex uh, uh, boy pairs uh, in, uh, in that respect. And then the third thing that we did, which I'm sure is eminently clever, has just gone out of my brain at the moment. But perhaps it will come back. Yeah, yeah, and so here would be the broad fronts. So when, the, when these effects first started coming, there would be the idea, like, is this just all going to be cognition, right? Um, that's clearly not the case, but it's partly the case, right? So in other words, what I mean by cognition are different, either differences in, in knowledge itself or in, or in other sorts of, of, of ways of measuring learning, things measured by standardized tests. Um, there's also a big front in, I mean, and, and this by itself should, should, should indicate that parts of the social science literature should take help wherever they can get it, which is that in social, there's a thing called non-cognitive skills that you may have heard of. I mean, kind of kind of get your head around that as a phrase, because it's a thing, but like, it's very vague, right? And so, so uh, but there is, if you take something like attempts to measure self-regulation or, or conscientiousness from uh, surveys, there's reasons to think that that is part of it. Um, maybe 10 uh, uh, or more percent of that. Uh, could be decomposed by that. Um, and I mean, one of the things that's appealing to me about, well, so the other thing just to mention would be, you know, there's also the possibility of, of things that actually are pure environmental effects but are working through the parent that's in the polygenic score, right? So, so that's a possibility. That's going to be very hard to untangle, uh, I think, right now. But it's, it's, it's on the horizon. But, but for... For those of us who work in survey measurement, like some of these things, like one of the reasons non-cognitive skills has had a difficulty getting more precision is that these things are very difficult to measure at scale, right? Um, they're difficult to measure in the first place. Like, do you tend to make short-sighted decisions that screw up your life? You can't really ask that in a direct kind of way, <laughs> right? And you can't, you can't like send two marshmallows in the mail to people, you know, or whatever things people do, right? And so there's the idea that if we have you know, whereas genomic data, 
So my other hats that were mentioned, I'm in a, a survey world. Straight survey methodology, as those of us who are, straight survey methodology is weird for a scientific instrument. It's not getting better, and it is, in fact, getting worse, right? Because we're having more difficulty getting people to respond and such. We're, we're using, administrative data is a big hope for, for that. But then another thing is, if, if we can use this, and we recognize it as a partial cause, we're not being determinist or anything, but as a partial, partial cause of a proxy, we may be able to get leverage on things like non-cognitive traits in ways that we don't currently have. So I think that's a real promise for this area. Did you have a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 and and that's a that's a so there's a there's a just a general cause for concern of, of mortality selection as a biasing uh, uh, effect for for looking at these things. That is to say that so for example in our study, um, the modal birth year of a Wisconsin Lunch that responded is 1939, and so they would have had to survive to be 67 to be in our DNA sample, right? And a fair number of, of especially men are are not alive uh, at age 67. Um, uh, so it's something to adjust for. And some work has been done on this on HRS. It's clearly associated with mortality. In our data, it's currently in the right direction, but not significant. But I think that that's just because we're not yet powered enough for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Mac? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so this is this is a source of, of of really big interest. Like if this if this worked, this would be this would be a blockbuster display, right? So the the problem with it is is uh, the question of pleiotropy, right? That is to say, the idea that for for most things that we would want to use it as an instrument for, we can't we can't satisfy the exclusion restriction. That is to say, that if you imagine like looking at educational attainment of mortality, right? That you that you wouldn't have grounds for saying like okay well um, the the same genetic variants causing educational attainment have some non-educational pathway effect on mortality right and so the question is if if it's if if that is simply going to be the case um, that is to say if the only way that that instrumental variables are effective is kind of the way if you have an econometric background to think about it um, this will not work. Um, uh, for that reason. Now, the question is whether or not, this is a very different instrumental variables problem, because in an instrumental variables problem, there's not the idea of, of like 100,000 weak instruments that can be put in, right? So this is still developing this is very much a, 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 a work in progress. And, and one of the, the, the uh, ideas that's getting a lot of traction, I'm, I'm skeptical of it, but I'll just, it would be that, well, you can, you can essentially look at the idea of Imagine taking, trying to use each of those individual weak instruments as instruments, and then looking if they have a, an ultimate effect distribution consistent with uh, pleiotropy not being a problem, right? Um, uh, which it takes on ideas of meta-analysis, right? Because it's almost like a publication bias problem, because pleiotropy would cause certain distortions that are like publication bias. Um, so that would be, I'm not sure about that particular technique, but the idea people are thinking in that direction it makes me not willing to rule it out of hand that that will eventually work. But I think that it's going to require an innovation in method. You can't just use off the shelf IV techniques. Yeah, in back. Uh, so I had a question about uh, about that. So yeah. uh, looking at a different population, Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, so so the the larger question there just being a lot of of underlying change in in educational attainment. I mean, that's I think that's really mentally useful for thinking about what a polygenic score would be, right? In that, in that 
uh, it, it moves us away from any kind of deterministic notion, right? Because you've got parents and children where you've got a big mean difference, and clearly there's no genetic difference, right? Um, and so, uh, but it raises, right, it, it raises, I mean, there are big underlying profound questions about social mobility here, right? Like in terms of the extent to which, uh, the extent to which when you have like a, a, a voluntary migrant population, right, and so you have a characteristic upward mobility and, and, and some people showing less mobility, how, how does that associate with the polygenic score, right? You can imagine a world where that is, that is very predictive, Right, of um, uh, you know, because two siblings in an immigrant family will often have very different outcomes, um, or you can imagine it being much more stochastic, right, uh, than that. And so I think it gives a leverage for that kind of way of thinking about about uh, interactions. Um, and you could also imagine, well, maybe it's the case that that uh, like for something like you know our enclaves. Uh, uh, you know, to settling an enclave, does that lead to a difference in the in the sort of polygenic effect? So I think there are a lot of interesting questions, right? And and the fact that there's this sort of of of, of, of either uh, you know upward mobility or varying mobility or 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 changing positions of migrants over time actually offers a lot of leverage. Um, should scores work well? Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much.